This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of the newborn King, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you know how stories are supposed to end. In fact, you've probably seen a phrase at the end of many a charming tale, many a fairy tale, many a made-up story. Maybe even if you're watching a movie, it even comes across the screen there at the end of every charming little movie. And they lived happily ever after. It almost seems that uh, we should be saying that phrase about now. We have the birth of a child. Despite difficult circumstances and travel, we have the baby boy born, firstborn son, the Savior, the Son of God, safely into this world. Redeemer has come. Messiah is here. And they lived happily ever after. But kind of like a car crash comes onto an idyllic scene on a quiet morning, we have an account today that kind of jars you. It kind of jars you because of the violence, the murder, the hate that's involved in a very, very difficult account to read. We're considering this also on the uh, first Sunday of the new year. And you know, when a new year turns over, people can have a variety of different feelings. You know, some have perhaps a relief. That year's over, and I'm glad it is because that was a hard year. Or perhaps there's an optimism. Or maybe there is some anxiety. Maybe there's some stress. Maybe there's some fear. After all, a new year brings some uncertainties, and it brings the passing of time where we wonder what the new year will hold. Will we live happily ever after? So today, on this first Sunday of the new year, let's consider the gospel reading for today, and let's be comforted. Let's be comforted and consider the theme, God takes care of his children. We're going to see in this account that, first of all, he took care of his son. And secondly, he will take care of you. Now, as we read this account, we have to know the background of this story. You probably know the account that happens right before the flight to Egypt. It is the visit of the Magi, or the wise men who came from the east. We have to know that. The wise men had traveled from afar. They had seen the star when they were in the east, and they traveled and traveled, and then the star disappeared as they got near Palestine, Jerusalem. <clears throat> so they went to Jerusalem and they asked King Herod, where's the new king? Herod didn't like that question, but he inquired of his um, learned scholars in the Old Testament where the, the Messiah was to be born, the, the king everyone talked about. And Micah 5.2 says, in Bethlehem, but you Bethlehem, though you are small, out of you will come the ruler. And so he told them, go Search for the child. You, you find the child and then come back and tell me because I want to worship him too. Which, of course, was a lie. Their visit had just occurred and those wise men were warned by God in a dream, don't go back to Herod. And so they returned by another route. Some time elapsed, I'm sure, and then it dawned on Herod. They're, they're not coming back. And Herod was upset and carried out the dastardly deed that we see in this account. Uh, just a few observations, perhaps, we should make about this account. It is chock full of vivid words. Very vivid words beginning with the word, Behold, or lo. There, there's a word in Greek, literally probably is translated, Look at that, look. Behold, and it begins here, not used in many English translations anymore, Behold, an angel, an angel. Now the angel already gave his message, but another one is needed. This is vivid because it's very interesting that God carries out his plans normally through human people 
human circumstances, human accounts, human stories, and sometimes it makes us wonder why, but he does, and also through lowly people. But when his plan is jeopardized or threatened, and when he must, he will step in with supernatural means if necessary. Sometimes we think that there's miracles happening every day in the Old Testament. That's not true at all. There were many, many long periods of time where miraculous events didn't happen. But when God had to, he did part the Red Sea, send fire from heaven on Mount Carmel, put manna on the floor of the desert, and, and so on. And here we have one of those accounts, a very vivid one. And he also appeared in a dream, so we would surmise, at night. Now? Has anyone ever woken you out of a dead sleep? I mean, just woken you out of a dead sleep, or the alarm went off, or barking was heard, or something, and what? Why, you know, why now? Wait, can this wait till morning? Can't wait till morning. Go now. And the word used is flee. Run for your life. Run now tonight. And run to Egypt? Egypt. Now? 400 miles away? It might surprise us a bit that Egypt was chosen here as the haven of refuge for, for Jesus, but actually there were people in the Old Testament who long had used Egypt as a place of refuge. You might remember Abraham went there. Jacob and the Israelites went there. Jeremiah went there at the time of the exile. And here again, there's a, a very urgent account that requires Egypt to be the place of, of refuge. And then we have the vivid words of the shocking decree that King Herod has his men carry out. It's very sadly ironic that Herod was the king, the ruler of the God-given institution of the government, the governing authorities that God has put over us in this world for our good. And we live under that flag too. And this was the one that threatened and took the life of many of its most innocent and helpless victims. It shouldn't surprise us, though. It shouldn't surprise us at all because this is Herod. We have many accounts of King Herod from history, especially Josephus, the, the Roman historian. He talks about the instability and the paranoia of King Herod. He rose to kingship because he had friends in the Roman government. But toward the end of his life, he became very unstable. He was very unpredictable. He put away his first wife, sent her away along with um, her son. Then he took another wife and he murdered her and her two sons and her brother and her mother and her grandfather. And then he murdered his firstborn son. And after that, he took eight more wives. This was a very unstable, unpredictable man. Not only that, but he was so hated in the Jerusalem area that toward the end of his life, as he was dying, he gathered many prominent men and he enclosed them and locked them into the hippodrome there. And he said, when I die, since no one will be mourning for me, I want you to put all of them to death and then there'll be some mourning that's going on in the country. Fortunately, that order was never carried out. But that was, that was King Herod. This is no surprise. In fact, I would say it's a reminder to us. It's a reminder that when Jesus shows up, when Jesus' message is proclaimed, and wherever he is, there's going to be surprising, even violent, vocal, clear opposition to that message. It was said in, in Genesis 3, I will put enmity. You remember what enmity is, right? Hatred between you, serpent, and the woman, and your offspring and hers. There will be hatred between the children of the light and children of the world. Not only that, but Simeon, that aged man who took the Christ in his arms at the presentation in the temple, said that people would rise and fall on this individual who had come into the world. He will be a sign that is spoken against, he said. And we also can remember that the reality today is that the same things are, are happening. The peace that the angels proclaimed on Christmas night was not peace on earth between everybody. It should be. But the ultimate peace that comes is peace between God and sinners that some people are not going to like and are going to reject. 
how different Joseph is. We can't miss the example of godly Joseph here. It said in verse 14, So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. Then after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. It's interesting that almost the exact same words are used for what Joseph did when God commanded it. No questions, nothing coming to God like, uh, are you sure we're going there? How long will we be there? Did you want us to leave right now during the night? No questions at all, but on questioning obedience. That's our vivid account. So let's get to the main point. Why? Because God takes care of his son. He took care of his son for you. He took care of him because of who this child is. The angels had said, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. This is the one who would fulfill all those prophecies. This is the one who will live for you. This is the one who would take your sin and guilt and he would die for it on a cross. This is the one who would rise from the dead. This is the one who is your Redeemer. And understanding that, it is no surprise that God would not have his plan thwarted at this very, I guess you could call it humanly speaking, vulnerable time. God took care of his son. Another main point is, this shows God's control over world circumstances and world history. In fact, we even see full, this is fulfillment of prophecy. God called this. God knew this, and he knew he would control it. In Hosea 11, when it says, Out of Egypt I called my son, that's not just talking about Pharaoh and Moses and everything. But that was ultimately fulfilled, secondarily, in world history, by the Messiah, who would come out of Egypt as well. When Rachel mourned for her children, this is ultimately fulfilled as well. Rachel was the beloved wife of Jacob. She's also the beloved mother figure of Israel. And, and Ramah. Ramah is where during the, the exile to Babylon, the captives were gathered. They were gathered there, and they were abused a bit there. Some were killed there, and they were deported from there. So figuratively, Rachel weeping for her children, being carried off to Babylon in a very dastardly deed as well. Rachel ultimately is fulfilled here with the slaughter of these young ones. And then he will be called a Nazarene. A bit of a mysterious prophecy, but now it makes sense how they would settle in, Jeru in uh, Nazareth, this young family. God, God is con in control of this whole situation as prophecy is fulfilled. How true it is when we sang in the psalm before, in Psalm 2, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. He took care of his son. So now we have to talk about ourselves. What about us? What about the new year? What about the uncertain future that lies ahead? Do you need taking care of? I, I recently read about a movie and book series. I haven't seen the movies or anything, but I, I read about the interesting concept. It's called The Purge. The Purge is a kind of famous movie where the concept is that for one day, for 12 hours, Anybody can do whatever they want. There are no crimes. There are no arrests that will be made. There's no prosecutions. Anybody can do whatever they want. There is no law enforcement that is available that day. There are no health services that are available that day. Now just think about that. If that concept were actually going to happen on February, whatever, how would you feel about that day? Would you be all excited 
about that day? I, I would imagine that there would be quite a few people who would load up for that day, who would hunker down for that day, who would disappear for that day and just try to ride out the day. I don't think they'd drive too much on the road. I don't think they'd walk too much in the downtown areas. I don't think they would want to see a lot of people. And it would be a day of quite a bit of fear for many. Well, let's take that a step farther. So what if God declared a holiday for a day? And God said, for one day, I'm going to do something else. I'm not going to have my providence and protection over your head. You're on your own for the earthly forces that are out there and, and even the spiritual forces that prey on you. That would be a scary and fearful day. And I think if the more we think about that, the more we realize the great need we have for being taken care of, far more than any, any earthly child that a parent even tries to take care of. But God will take care of you. He will take care of you. In the famous Psalm, Psalm 91, it says, If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. God will take care of you. He's promised you. You're his son. You're his daughter. But that still might leave the question, what about those Bethlehem boys? What about those children that day? Why that God? We have to say a couple things about that. The first, the first thing is that we can never pin the blame for evil on God. He does not wish evil. He does not plan evil. He does not want evil. Evil is against his nature. He is in charge, of course, but don't blame God for evil activity. He does allow evil people to plan and plot, and he does allow, at times, evil to supposedly have its day for a moment. But he does not plan and is not the author of evil. Another thing is that we do not have specific answers in all circumstances for why certain things happen. We do not have specific answers for specific events in our world today or back then. And we must be okay with that because he's God and because the mind and thoughts of God are above our minds and our thoughts. We do know this, he has not promised heaven here. He has not promised to take all suffering away, to take all evil away, or to take death away. His grace has promised us a way through to the final grace that he's promised us in heaven. But he has not promised to make a utopia here in this world. In fact, we could ask that same question of a lot of different events, couldn't we? Couldn't we ask that of Pharaoh in Egypt when all the baby boys were cast into the Nile? Why that baby? Why was that one born at that time? Why did you allow evil at that time? We could ask that question of, of a multitude of accounts in the Bible with why this, why now, why then? We also could ask that every day in this world too. Why this, why me, why now? Every time a person dies, I guess. We could ask that question. This just happens to be a more graphic and sad account of the effects of sorrow and sin in a diabolical plot. But we can rest assured God will take care of us. And one day he will deliver us in the best way, in the best way to heaven through our Savior Jesus. And it is our prayer that all of those who perished that day in that sad incident are now with their Savior in heaven. We pray that. And we know that God does what is good and right and will bring us through to that place he has prepared for us. So until that day in this new year, take comfort. Even though this story in this chapter does not end with the words, and they lived happily ever after, your end will end happily ever after. God took care of his son and God will take care of you because you are his child. Amen. Please rise.